I have the honor of introducing this afternoon's program. However, I want to say a few paid political announcements first. You have a um, survey in your chairs, and it would help us very much if you would fill it out. I also want to thank our sponsors. We have a lot of sponsors for this event. Thank you so much. But in particular, John and Jeannie Mag Mangum sponsored this event today. And without them, <laughs> raise your hands. Without them, this would not have been possible. So thank you so much. So um, I was telling our upcoming guests that I kind of wing it because I've had to introduce him so many times, but it's been such a pleasure to work with Joe M. Turner. He's um, performed in New York and Atlanta and all over the world, and he has contributed his expertise to our Houdini exhibition. It's been unbelievable working with him. He's fabulous. Um, he's Atlanta-based, but he's been at corporate events and theater events all over the world, as I said, and he uh, has produced numerous magical events and shows, some of which he'll be doing for us in a few weeks. Um, in addition to his own speaking engagements and performances, because he uses magic as an entree into lots of corporate events, and he did a bar mitzvah last night. Um, he's also our programming partner for Inescapable, so he'll tell you more about who you're about to meet. So please welcome Joe Turner. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Atlanta Magic community, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here. Uh, you've already heard about the amazing oh, magical programming that is oh, happening as part of the inescapable uh, exhibition throughout the summer. So please, uh, make plans to come back on Sunday afternoons uh, from now through August, and you'll find amazing lectures and performances and opportunities to really find out what makes magic happen here in the city of Atlanta. It has been a real honor to work with the Bremen Museum uh, on their programming. Uh, it is my pleasure now to introduce you to a man I've known for about 20 years, uh, a, a, a fantastic magician, uh, author, entrepreneur. Uh, I could go on and on, but what I'll just narrow it down to a few uh, short things. First of all, uh, he has got a show running in New York called Six Impossible Things. I'd encourage you to go see it, but good luck getting a ticket because <laughs> it's sold out. Uh, this man has fooled Penn and Teller. He's one of that elite club. And uh, you might have even seen him on The Tonight Show recently. Please welcome my friend Joshua J. Thanks, Joe. Thank you so much. Hello. Welcome. We're going to start this unusual afternoon with a card trick. And it's not going to be the most involved card trick you've ever seen. In fact, this will be a card trick that for the many magicians who are here from the local magic scene, they probably know it or do some version of it. But what I can promise you is that by the end of this talk, you're going to see this card trick in a very different way. So it starts very simple, like this. Sir in the front row on the corner. Say stop anytime. Right there, a little more, a little less, you happy? Remember this card. I'm gonna cut your card back into the deck. A quick shuffle. And now, you will find his card. Would you stand, please? Touch any card. Just touch. This one right here. Ladies and gentlemen, the three of spades. <laughs> Notice I didn't say that was his card, I just said that's the three of spades. You better sit down. It appears we've made a mistake. You, you picked the three of spades, but that's not your card, right? You all saw his card. Yes. What was his card? You can say. Nine of hearts. Nine of hearts. Okay. You actually did just fine. It just takes a moment to find the nine of hearts. This is a trick called wrong card, right card. It's a simple 
magic trick. It's kind of like a, a standard that magicians riff on and do different things. I've got a few different versions. This is the simplest one. This trick was shown to Warner Reich at Auschwitz. His bunkmate did this trick for him and then taught him this trick, which instilled in him a love of magic that he has to this day. So right now, without further ado, we're going to get into this love of magic, this unusual place that he found magic, and the incredible life of Warner Reich. Right over here. Thank you very much. Thank All you. All right. So we want to talk about a lot of things, but when we've shared the stage before, it's been a great honor. And one thing I notice is that the real power of having Warner here is you guys getting to ask questions. It's not every day you get to talk to somebody who's lived through so much and experienced so much. So we're gonna limit the interview to about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to many questions which I hope you will ask. So, we're gonna get to the magic, but let's start at the beginning. Tell us where you were born, early life. Early life. Uh, I was born in Berlin, Germany. My father was a mechanical and an electrical engineer, and we lived a typical, uh, middle-class Jewish life in Germany. In 1933, when Hitler came to power, a couple of things happened. Number one, a law was instituted that Jews couldn't work for major corporations, colleges, and uh, hospitals. And the other problem was that uh, there came a law of overcrowding of schools which meant that the principals of the schools could decide who could go to school and who couldn't. And obviously, Jews were cut out. And so, in 1933, my father didn't have a job anymore, and uh, my sister and I, we couldn't go to school. So we left Germany and we went to Yugoslavia. Um, the reason why we went to Yugoslavia was my father was an officer during World War I in the Austro-Hungarian army and he had spent some time in Yugoslavia, so he thought it would be a great place to go to. And at that time, 1933, everybody thought, you know, in two years Hitler will be over and we'll return back home. Uh, obviously, everybody was wrong. And uh, we had to sell our house for next to nothing. And when we left the country, about 25% of all of our uh, financial means were confiscated by the government as a, a I think, emigration tax or something like that. In any case, we came to Yugoslavia, and my father couldn't find a job because Yugoslavia was strictly agricultural. Uh, at that time, just to give you an idea, the country was something like 75% illiterate. Uh, they were having huge natural resources, but they were all exported to Germany or to some other countries where they were, were refabricated and then imported to Yugoslavia. Warner, did you, did your parents tell you why you were leaving Germany? Did you sense what the problems were? Or were you, because uh, you were born in 27. Yes. And this is 33. So you yeah. were young. I, I was six years old. No, my parents didn't communicate, didn't tell me why we left Germany. Uh, my parents were typical Victorians, and they believed in the theory that children are to be seen and not heard. I didn't know, for instance, 
what a concentration camp was until I found myself in one. Uh, so I didn't know that my parents had financial problems in Yugoslavia. I didn't know why we left Germany. I, my father uh, suffered from a kidney disease. I wasn't even advised of that. I only found out many years later from my sister, maybe 30, 40 years later, uh, why uh, the causes of my father's death. Okay, so now you find yourself in Yugoslavia, yeah. and things take a turn for the worse. No, things were very nice for oh, me. Okay. I was a kid, I was very happy. I went to schools, I learned court, and I learned Serbian writing, and uh, uh, I was happy. I didn't know the problems that my parents had. And then in 1940, my I never experienced any anti-Semitism whatsoever. And in 1940, my father died. And then a few months later, Germany invaded Yugoslavia. And that's when everything changed. Everything got turned upside down. So let's, t I wanna take a quick pause because one thing you've said to me that I find, you know, particularly galling is, talk about your mother because she was a proud German. My mother was an extremely proud German. She was a typical German Jew. Uh, German Jews were proud of Germany. They were fighting and during World War I. My mother was in the German army and so was her brother. Uh, just to give you an idea how proud the Germans were, or German Jews were, in 1914, they were roughly three quarters of a percent of Germany was Jewish. Three quarters of one percent. Yet the German military had three percent of Jews. So in other words, four times the anticipated number of Jews attended, uh, signed up for the military. My mother fought on the Eastern Front, uh, fought. she was a nurse on the Eastern Front and uh, she saved the lives of a whole bunch of German soldiers and as a result of that she was awarded the Iron Cross with a citation that the gratitude of the fatherland will be with you forever. And she believed it. She actually believed it. And in addition to this, her father fought in the war in the United States and, and uh, in the Civil War. And uh, he uh, obtained American citizenship. So my mother was a German. She was, she was a Iron Cross winner and she was also an American citizen. So she felt 100% safe. Nothing will ever happen to her. So then what happened when Germany, uh, when, when Hitler came to power, you're in Yugoslavia and your father's dead and your mother has to make a choice. Tell us about that. Well, at that point, <clears throat> Germany invaded Yugoslavia, and Yugoslavia, which many of you may know, was really no country until 1918, when it was assembled from six countries, Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, and these countries were put together into one country called Yugoslavia, and in 19... 41, when Germany invaded Yugoslavia, the country fell apart. Now, and not only that, they, that the country fell apart, but various countries were fighting each other. The Serbs were fighting the Bosnians and the Croats. The Croats were fighting the Serbs. And uh, so there was a constant internal warfare going on. 
the Serbs were fighting the Germans, but the Croats were very much pro-German and the, they instituted a man called Dr. Ante Pavelic to be the head of the government in Croatia and he was a Nazi of the worst kind. He immediately opened a concentration camp and sorry, I don't want to use the word concentration camp, extermination camp. Uh, Yasenovac, there were six concentration extermination camps that Germany had and they were all in Poland and the seventh was Yasenovac. And in Yasenovac about 200,000 people were murdered. Of them roughly 20,000 were Jews. So your mother, decided to do something with you and your sister? My mother felt safe. She knew that being an American and being uh, an Iron Cross bearer, she was safe. But the children were not. So I had a four-year-old sister, four, a sister who was four years older than me. And she placed my sister with one couple and she placed me with another couple who worked for the resistance movement, which was sort of a rather stupid idea, placing me with somebody who is being eagerly searched for by the German uh, secret police. Anyway, she played, it's like hiding the cheese what was in a mouse trap. <laughs> And what was life like living with this uh, partisan family? Uh, life was very, extremely lonely because first of all, they were adults. I was 13 at that time. And at that time, I, as I pointed out, uh, children and adults did not really mix. Uh, that was the time when many children called call their father sir and their mother madam. And uh, I had absolutely no relationship with that couple. I cooked, I cleaned, I, uh, and most of the time I spent in the bathroom developing films and making enlargements for the resistance movement. I had no contact with any of my friends. Whenever I called them up on the phone, there was somebody else on the phone whose voice I didn't recognize. By this time, most of them were already dead. So what happens, what's the next chapter? The next chapter was that uh, I lived there for two years and uh, one morning, uh, there was a knock at the door and uh, four or five Gestapo agents came in. Gestapo is the Geheime Staatspolizei, which is German secret police. And they walked in and they took everything out of the closet and threw it on the floor. There was a guy standing there. I was lying, uh, sleeping on a couch in the living room and he was standing with a gun over me. It's the first time in my life I've ever seen a, a gun, you know, particularly pointed at me. And then at one point I wanted to go to the bathroom and uh, he ordered me to keep the door open and he stood there with a gun. Uh, it's not a pleasant feeling to communicate with nature having a gun at your back. Anyway, it uh, speeds up, never mind. <laughs> so um, you were taken, you were taken away and you were taken uh, to the Graz, I was, right? Uh, they arrested me and they took me down to their headquarters and then I was taken to a room and there was a small stocky Gestapo agent there and he kept asking me questions. And uh, I was playing a big hero. First of all, I didn't know anything anyway where these people got the films from, but in any case, I uh, felt 
And this is, I felt this throughout the first uh, maybe six months of my imprisonment. I was innocent. I didn't commit any crime, so nobody can do anything to me. And the guy questioned me, and it made no difference what answer I gave him. He always hit me. And I was bleeding and crying all over his carpet. And that went on for a few hours. You were 13. I was 13. Beating I, up a 13-year-old. It's crazy. Yeah, well, I mean, his, his mother must have been very proud of him anyway. So. And, they, and I like this detail. They stuck you in a, a holding cell with several other people, right? No, no, no. Oh, no. that's later. That, that, that came later, no. Okay. And then I was locked up in a basement in a, in a cell that must have been a coal cellar before. There was nothing in it, which was concrete floor. And there was a bucket there for, to be used as a toilet. And I was there for three days. And <clears throat> I lived on liverwurst sandwiches for three days. And they obviously lacked imagination as far as food is concerned. And after three days, I was shipped to a border town between Croatia and Slovenia. And there I was locked up in a little wooden shed, which must have been a drunk tank or so, which was filled with fleas, millions of them. It was springtime, I had short sleeved shirt and short pants and these fleas, they just attacked me and uh, it, it, was, it was unadulterated hell. Uh, after three days, I was shipped. Uh, a Gestapo agent came and we went by train from Slovenia to Graz, Austria. And uh, we arrived at the railroad station and there was a big uh, uh, police car truck and uh, with the bars on the window and they took me to a jail in Graz and to the uh, main police station and there I was locked up in a little cell with uh, three other kids. Uh, they were not Jewish. Two of them had been arrested for burglary and the third kid had murdered his mother and I was the fourth criminal there. And that's where I had my only revenge on the German government because I infected that cell and the adjacent cell with fleas. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's uh, about the total extent of my revenge. So you're in this cell with somebody who murdered their mother. Yeah. And two kids convicted of burglary. Yes, but that day I, I was still a low man on a totem pole because I was Jewish, you know, and they were not. So, I mean, they had a chance of coming out alive, you know, I didn't. But I didn't know any of that. I, I didn't have the slightest idea. I was totally naive. I was there for six weeks. And then uh, <clears throat> one day I looked out of the prison window into the yard and I saw my mother walking around in a circle and uh, that's the last time I saw her. A couple of weeks ago I was in Jerusalem and I went to Yad Vashem and I spent two hours with them and searching and researching. I had two jobs to do. One of them is they had me listed as dead. Uh, my wife claimed it for years, but anyway, <laughs> uh, I had to prove to them that I was alive and they gave me lots of uh, information about me and uh, they didn't have any more information about, about my mother. mother. The only thing they had was that I reported that she was in Graz. That's the last thing. So you saw your mother from the prison cell window. Yes. Were you able to shout to her or? No, no, no. no. There, was the, there were the bars. Uh, the bars were inside the cell and then maybe, I don't know what, six, eight inches further there was the glass. Horrible. And then, so you, no, you couldn't. Okay, and then tell and us. I, I was up on the 
six uh, on the third floor, uh, which was equivalent to a uh, five-story tall building okay. because the other two floors were very, very, had high ceilings. Okay. So keep going. Tell us what happened after this holding cell that you were in. After this holding cell, I was uh, there for, as I said, uh, six weeks. I was taken by police car to Vienna, the city of my dreams. And I was locked up for, during the night in a beautiful synagogue that had been destroyed during the night of the broken glass. There was soot and dirt and there were torn prayer books and there were about 120 other people there. And from there, the next morning, we were put into railroad cars and went on a two-day train ride to Theresienstadt, uh, which was in Czechoslovakia. Uh, Theresienstadt, or as it's known in Czech, is a Terrorism. old fortress. Actually, there were two fortresses, one large fortress, on one side of the river and a small fortress on the other side of the river. And uh, on the other side, there was a prison. And uh, for those of you who are history aficionados, that's where Gavrilo Princip, the man who murdered Prince Ferdinand II, who started World War I, was locked up and where he also died. Uh, anyway, Theresienstadt was, a, as I said, a fortress. And when planes were invented, fortresses became useless because all you do is you fly over them and drop a couple of bombs. So the civilians moved out and uh, about 3,000, uh, uh, the military moved out and about 3,000 civilians moved in. And then Hitler had, uh, or the German government had a brilliant idea. The Swiss authorities and the Swedish authorities and the Red Cross accused the Germans of mistreating Jews. Uh, and they were not permitted to do that. That's a no no. They were supposed to be treated like prisoners of war under the Geneva Convention. And the Germans had to convince the various authorities that they are really nice guys and don't hurt the Jews. So they transformed Theresienstadt into a demonstration city for the uh, SS, for the uh, Germans. Uh, they, uh, Jews wore regular clothing. We had to wear yellow star and we also, they gave them musical instruments. They sent in the intelligentsia of Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia to Theresienstadt. So they gave them pencils and paper, and the children were educated in schools, and uh, everything looked hunky-dory. There were only two major problems. Uh, the first problem was that the food was lousy. You know, it was typical concentration camp slot. So if there was an inspection, you know, they had to do something about that. So that was easy to cure. The, all you had to do is you just improve the food. You just bring in better food for the day than when the inspection is there. But there was another problem you had before 3,000 people lived there, and suddenly they were around about 60,000. And uh, that means uh, 20 times more people uh, than before. So what do you do with these people? Well, the solution was very easy. All you do is you pack them into railroad cars, and you ship them to Auschwitz, to the gas chambers, and you kill them. And that's what they did. And as a result of that, in Theresienstadt, 
141,000 people had been shipped to Theresienstadt and uh, 17,000 survived. That's it. So one thing that, that I'm just so curious about when I hear you tell this story is I can't get over that you went through all of this alone. I mean, so many Holocaust stories that I hear and that I, that I read about, at least for part of the journey, they go through with some family, but you were alone this whole time. Can you talk a little bit about whether you were lonely or did you make friends or did you kind of go in with another family or how did that work? Uh, I made friends and I was sort of a convinced that all of this is going to stop very soon. First of all, I didn't know anything about the death camps or anything that happened after yeah. Theresienstadt. And uh, I was totally naive about what was going on. I had no idea what a true concentration camp was. I had no idea uh, that the word death even entered into the formula. So uh, I made friends uh, like a typical teenager. I spoke German, so many of the, obviously I could communicate with the German and the Austrian uh, kids there. I could not communicate with the Czech kids because they spoke Czech. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was, in daytime, I was never lonely. It was at night. At night? At night, yeah. Of course. So what happens next? You're at this ne show camp. Ne next, I, there was obviously a, another, uh, how do you call it? Uh, I, I worked there, by the way. I laid railroad tracks, I exterminated vermin, I made uh, big baskets for carrying uh, potatoes. I did all different types of work. And then I, after 10 months, uh, there was obviously another inspection coming and I was surplus goods and they took us uh, about 2,500 of us, and they put us into 25 railroad cars, 100 people per car. They gave us a, a piece of bread and a can, couple of cans of sardines, which the Red Cross must have sent. And uh, we were given that and put into railroad cars, cattle cars. And they put in a bucket and closed the doors, windows, and off we went for on a three-day ride. And uh, obviously the buckets overflowed after an hour, and for three days we were lying in our feces and in our urine, and then after three days the doors opened, and we were faced by a group of SS men and people in striped uniforms and uh, every one of them had a walking stick. And they were hitting us over the faces, over, wherever they could. People were lying and bleeding on the floor. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, a scene out of hell. So we asked, where are we? And they told us, you were in Auschwitz, Birkenau. Never heard of it. And we were then stripped of everything that we had. We were tattooed, uh, got a tattoo on our arms, and then we were given striped uniforms. So I wanna just take a pause for some of the younger people watching. Uh, is it easy for you to roll your sleeve back? Yeah. Can you see it? And tell us about this number and how that worked. It says A, what does that say? A, 1828. And by the way, I, when I was on my honeymoon in Paris, uh, I bought a lottery ticket with that number, <laughs> and it lost. <laughs> what the hell did you expect, winning? <laughs> uh, uh, no, you, 
you stood in line. It's a sort of a, it was a traumatic, very short experience. Uh, we arrived, we were stripped naked, and we were standing there, and there was a, and there were guys uh, sitting in on chairs, and they had uh, razors, and they uh, shaved your uh, pubic hair, and they smeared it with some extremely burning liquid, I think Lysol or something like that. The Nazis were terrified of lice. They, they, I mean, they, 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 they were absolutely a maniac about it. And then they, they cut all our hair off. And then one, there were two guys sitting there. One had a piece of paper, cards or something. They asked you a couple of questions. The next guy grabbed your arm and uh, took a needle, tattooed it. Next. And the, the whole thing lasted so, maybe a minute. Then that was it, finished. So Warner, at this point, you know, you, you spoke a moment ago about saying, well, we didn't know what was going to happen next. I was an optimist, uh -huh. I was naive. At this point, three days in a cattle car, you get off and you see Auschwitz. Are you starting to think differently now? Is no. this it? No. no, no, no. Still optimistic. Still, still optimist, you know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I uh, the only death I've encountered where a couple of people who had died in my car when we were when we traveled there, but no, it's still, uh, still, you know, things will uh, will straighten out. You know, it was uh, I, I wasn't threatened in any form. I was beaten, but uh, certainly not, uh, you know, except for the guy standing over me while I was sitting on the toilet, you know, in Zagreb, but um, with a gun. Uh, but uh, beyond that, uh, no, I was, uh, I was still, I, I was naive. I was totally, I believe nothing is going to happen. And uh, then we got into the camp and there were people who had been sent from Theresienstadt before. And they told us, hey, you'll be here. Did you sign a card that you'll be here for six months? As, as a security, and I said, yeah, we signed it. So I said, well, in six months, you leave the camp through the chimney. And he said, what? So I said, you leave the camp through the chimney. I said, well, what does that mean? So you'll see, and that was that. And then we thought it was a stupid joke, and it took me about two weeks until it actually sank in because the camps were separated by barbed wire so you could see a mile, you know, there was nothing uh, to stop you and uh, our, the crematoria were not too far from us, maybe a thousand feet or something like that. And uh, we saw people walking in, and we smelled the smell, and we heard people crying, but it didn't add up. But then suddenly, we understood what was happening, and we felt like uh, right, uh, rats in a trap. There was no place where you can go. And it was an absolutely horrible feeling because you couldn't communicate uh, with the other people who were exactly in the same boat. And in daytime you spoke, but at night when you were lying in the barracks, that's when you were terribly, terribly lonely. And uh, it was... Uh, then we started seeing people committing suicide. They threw themselves against the wire. They were all people in their mid, late thirties, people who lost their families, lost their business. There was no reason for them to exist. 
Bien. Talk about the barracks a little more. You talked about you wanted to be high in the barracks instead of low. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons, well, first of all, the, the bunks were on three levels. And the lowest bunks were taken usually by very, very strong guys or very weak guys. Uh, strong guys liked it because they could sit down and just lie down and uh, that was it. And the weak guys, they couldn't climb up. So the middle level was at a disadvantage because you had to crawl and you were, uh, you banged your head against the boards of the upper. But the upper one, if you had the energy and the strength, uh, was nice because number one, no urine and no feces dribbled on you as they were in the others. And uh, secondly, you could raise your head. So that's the reason why I chose the upper one. All right, so now you had an interesting meeting in the barracks. Yes. Tell us about this chance encounter. I was, uh, when I got into the, we were assigned the barracks and I climbed up on the top barrack. I didn't know all the other things that were happening, but uh, I sort of, uh, and I don't know, I just liked the idea of being up on top. So I climbed up on top and I laid second from the edge. There were six people there, uh, three lying in one direction and three lying in the other direction. There was a guy laying next to the edge, then I was in the middle and then there was another guy next to me. And the guy next to me, the one next to the edge, he was a man in his, uh, at that time, uh, he was, 30, um, he was about uh, 34 years old. And uh, he was very friendly and he introduced himself as Herr Levine. And uh, I, he was an adult, obviously I was a kid. I was 16 at that time. And uh, I was, uh, you know, I was glad that he even spoke to me. And he sort of uh, inquired about me a little bit. All I knew is that he was born in, uh, that he came from Germany. And obviously he had been in uh, Terezin because he came on the same transport as I did. And uh, one day I were, had been assigned to some work assignment and in the camp and I came back and there was Herr Levine sitting there with a deck of cards. And seeing somebody in the camp with a deck of cards is like uh, finding a gorilla in your bathroom. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, uh, there's absolutely, you know, you can't comprehend where it came from, what it was doing there, or anything of the sort. And uh, then he proceeded to show me a card trick, which was already knocked my socks off, although I didn't have any. <laughs> uh, and uh, he then immediately explained it to me. He didn't wait for me to ask him, but he immediately explained it to me. And I remembered the, his words. I remembered every detail. It was the first trick I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen a magician before. I've never seen a card trick. I've seen some very primitive card tricks before, but this one, uh, was unbelievable. And from that point on, I practiced that card trick every single day in my head. And uh, from Auschwitz, I went uh, 
Do you want me to continue? Yeah, I, I do, but just let's pause for a yes. moment and talk yes. about this magician. Yes. So his name was Levine, but... Herbert Levine. Herbert Dev Levine, yes. but his stage name was Nivelli, which is Levine backwards with just like Houdini, Slidini, with the, you know, Nivelli, right? So you add that to it. So remarkably, I mean, just to sort of pause and let you know, magicians don't explain their tricks after they do it, but something about this man in that circumstance, giving hope to the people around him, to his bunkmate, yeah. Warner, he teaches this trick. And even a simple trick like the one he taught, the one that you saw, it's not simple in layman's terms. I mean, this isn't something you practice in your head, but it is remarkable that you were able to keep the method, the inner workings, the subtle differences, the, the way that the hands have to move in accordance with what you're saying. I mean, even simple magic tricks are very complicated. And he kept it all in his head and was able to do it after he was liberated. I mean, that's extraordinary. I, I remembered, I think the most important thing is, I remembered the rhythm, the movement, I remembered the flow of the trick. And that's what actually, uh, yeah. that's the thing that I did remember. So let's, before we continue with the rest of your yes. story, um, talk a little bit about how you have stayed in magic and mentalism even today? Uh, I, about a year and a half, uh, no, maybe three years later, I found myself in London and I went and I bought myself a deck of cards and I, for the first time in three years, I actually performed the trick. I performed it for myself. And it worked. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I couldn't believe it. It actually worked. And I showed it to some friends of mine, and they were amazed. And then I went to, I discovered a magic store in uh, London, and I bought some magic tricks. And I amazed my friends with them, and then I bought some magic books. And, uh, you know, they say there's a very thin line between a hobby and insanity. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and even to this day, you're a member of the International and Brotherhood of Magicians. I became a member of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. I'm a member of the Psychic Entertainers Association. I, I have a fairly large library at home, and uh, I love magic. But most importantly, what came out of it is I developed a certain stage presence. And that stage presence permits me today to go to schools, and I speak close to 100 times a year in schools, to go to schools and talk about the Holocaust and fight anti-Semitism and fight bias. And that's probably... Okay. So let's, we'll come back to magic in a moment. That's of course why we're all here in conjunction with this Houdini exhibition, but we need to go back to the story. So you're in Auschwitz. How long did you stay there? I stayed in Auschwitz well, on, I came in May. On July 6th, I went through three selections by Dr. Mengele, where he sorted out 89 of us out of a lot of 5,000. And the 89 of us, we were sent to another camp, and the other 5,000 over the next five days were sent to the gas chambers. Did you... I mean, how close were you to Dr. Mengele? I, I saw him every day. He was walking through the camp every day. So, I mean, I tried to stay away from him. And, you know, it, and when you say you were sorted, did you have to run in front of him? No, did we were running. Him? We were stripped naked. And we run for our lives. We try to look taller and stronger and healthier. 
happy or anything that will make you look better than you. We, we were scarecrows, we were skinny. We lived on 400 calories of food a day. And uh, we, many of us had diarrhea, and we were just uh, skeletons. And yet, we were trying our best to survive. It was a question of life or death. Yeah. And, and so 89 of you yeah, were selected uh, and sent away to we, where? We were sent to an adjacent camp uh, to the penalty uh, division of the camp. And uh, I was sent from there to Auschwitz I, where all the criminals were the one which has the big sign which says Arbeit macht frei. And that's where I worked in the stables. I fed the horses, I brushed them, and I also stole some of their food because they were feeding them dried sugar beets. So I could supplement my meager diet wow. with some <laughs> sugar beets. Whatever you have Listen, to do. if you're hungry, you, as long as it doesn't move, move, you eat it, you know, I mean, it's, uh, uh, so I was there till January 1945, and in January 1945, all the criminals, all the coppers, were put in German uniforms and sent to the Russian front, because the Russians were advancing, and 60,000 of us, we went on a three-day death march, and, uh, to Mauthausen? From, no, no, we went from Mauthausen to some Polish village uh, 35 miles away. And uh, it was winter, ice, snow, and the only wa water we had was snow and ice, and we had no food. And of the 15, of the 30, of the 60,000, 15,000 died during that march. And the rest of us, we were loaded into open railroad cars, and we traveled for four days, and we ended up in Mauthausen. And maybe over half the people died on that trip. And when we came to Mauthausen, which was a concentration camp from <coughs> hell, and we were showered and we collapsed because all of us were frostbitten and my feet started to rot. And there was a Serbian doctor. He cut off my toes on one foot and part of the toes on the other foot. And that's how he saved my life. Then things got really bad because we were squeezed between Russian forces and American forces, and there was no food there. But when they cut off your toes, there were no bandages, right? No, no, there was just paper. He just had paper. And, and did you ask for this? Did you go to somebody and say, hey, my, no, my feet are no, starting no. to turn color? No, when I arrived, I was, and I collapsed, uh, I was swearing very loudly in Croat. And in that camp, there were lots of Serbian prisoners of war. And obviously, they spoke Croat. So they understood and they knew he is one of our boys. And, uh, and he took pity on you and he yeah, helped you. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but then you can't walk when they cut part of your toes off for a few days, right? Pardon? You couldn't walk. No, no, after I they... would, Well, I, by this time, uh, what happened was all the SS had, uh, were taken into the military and uh, the camps were closed, very, very little food entered. Mauthausen was a fortress, again, was built like a fortress. So uh, they starved us to death. There were thousands upon thousands of dead bodies. There, we, we ended up getting a tablespoon of moldy bread a day. Uh, I slept next to a dead man for three days just to get his ration. So uh, I was about this close to dying. It, How much did you weigh? Uh, I was end? 17 at that time, and then I weighed 64 pounds when I was liberated. So talk about um, the liberation now. Well, then we were liberated, and the 
a small group of soldiers came, I don't know, maybe 30, 50, and uh, they didn't know that there was a concentration camp. They didn't have the slightest idea. And now they found themselves with thousands upon thousands of starving people, tens of thousands of dead bodies, people who were diseased, who were about to flee from the camp uh, and uh, distribute diseases throughout the countryside. And they had to continue fighting because the war was still going on. This was, we were liberated on the 5th of May. And the 7th of May, the war was over. But uh, that still, they were still commanded to move on. So the only food they had were military rations. The little boxes, K box, K rations, had a little can of a cho a chopped egg and ham and three Chesterfields and uh, a small can opener in it. And that was the stuff that they gave us. They were roughly 2,700 calories in three packages. And they gave us the stuff to eat. I ate a can of chewing tobacco. I didn't know what I was eating. <laughs> no, I, I, I couldn't speak English. You know, and uh, uh, as a result of that, uh, maybe 20,000 people died. What and do you mean, as a result of? Of eating that uh, food, because we got terrible diarrhea, and they had no medications or anything to help. So it was a shock to the system. Well, it's, uh, it's like uh, me giving you a bottle of olive oil. Yeah. We had nothing, uh, nothing in us. So round it out and tell us how you ended up uh, in London and then America. Well, I went to England. Uh, I went to Yugoslavia and I found no parents. I found no friends. And there was severe communism under Marshal Tito. I was for two years, I went, I went to a partisan school and uh, practiced. Uh, and uh, learned the beauties of communism. And uh, from there, I managed to escape to England. And uh, when I came to England, I had no skills. I had no education. My schooling stopped when I was 13. And uh, I couldn't speak English. So I started working as a laborer, then as a machine tool fitter, then as a tool and die maker. I got married, I came to the States, I went to college for 10 years at night, and uh, uh, I, I, I have no complaints. I've been married to a most fabulous, incredible woman for 61 years. She unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, she passed on a couple of years ago. She was the love of my life. And uh, life, I, I have two sons. I have two delightful daughters-in-law who are much too good for them. <laughs> and uh, I have four grandchildren. Life has been very, very good to me. I really have no complaints. I, I really, I, I was lucky. I was really lucky. Warner Wright. If we can have some house lights and microphones, I would very much like to give you an opportunity to ask Warner questions. Right over here. I saw one. Um, just two weeks ago, we were in Auschwitz with our synagogue. We did a Jewish heritage tour. And the fact that anybody at all survived such inhumanity is shocking. The fact that you survived such an experience is unbelievable. 
Um, where did you settle when you came to America, and what did you do to make a living? She's asking, um, where in America did you settle, and what did you do for a living, for your work? Uh, I was, uh, I settled in New York because my sister survived the war, and uh, she came to the United States, and uh, I settled in New York, and now I live on Long Island. Uh, I worked as an industry engineer, uh, primarily in the food business, food industry, supermarkets, and warehousing, distribution, and transportation. Yeah, um, going through everything that you did, if you could say a word to your 13-year-old self um, as the SS first came in, what would you tell yourself? He's asking if you could go back and tell your 13-year-old self some word or piece of advice, what would you say? Run. <laughs> I, I really, uh, you know what, the problem, uh, it's extremely difficult for me. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you can give sound advice like hide, but uh, hide where? Who, who's going to hide you? If, you, if I went with the partisans, and many of my friends did, uh, most of them died during the war. They were, uh, instead of in a concentration camp, they died in the forests of, uh, of uh, Bosnia. Uh, so I really, I, 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 I can't think of anything, uh, you know, even if you, there was no chance of escaping to other countries. It's uh, probably if I think for a long time, maybe I'd figure out something, but it's not as easy. Like for instance, people tell me, ask me very often, uh, have you tried to escape from uh, the concentration camp? You know, it sounds great, you know, you see these fabulous movies, you see these ultra stupid uh, German soldiers, you know, uh, who eat sauerkraut and have funny names. Uh, but in reality, to escape from a camp is extremely difficult. Let me just, uh, to give you, uh, first of all, you need proper clothing. We had only striped clothing. We had a tattoo, we had no hair, we couldn't speak the language, we had no maps, we had no money, we had no identification card. I mean, it, it, it all sounds very easy and very light. Uh, 1,300,000 people have been shipped to Auschwitz. Exactly two managed to successfully escape, two. And they were both Slovak soldiers, resistance movement soldiers, and who were fully trained, so. Uh, let's, let's take a couple more okay. questions and then. Yes, yeah. okay. Um, first, I wanna thank you very much uh, for this very moving presentation you did and uh, very uh, difficult things and everything that you've gone through and how you've been able to be here and share this with us. I uh, just had one question. How did you maintain your sense of humor? How did you maintain your sense of humor? Uh, humor was an exceedingly important aspect of our lives in Auschwitz and in the concentration camp. The only other conversation that people had, first of all, we had no news what was happening from the outside of the camp. And uh, occasionally people came from other camps and there were some rumors. The main subject of conversation in all the camps was food. And uh, we were starving. We were actually starving. And to talk about food while you're starving makes you only more hungry. 
And uh, so we had, uh, we had joke sessions and just about every night we had joke sessions where somebody would tell a joke in Yiddish and then uh, somebody else would translate it into German, somebody into Polish, somebody into Russian. Then somebody would tell a joke in Romanian and that somebody would translate it into Yiddish and so on. And so we had joke sessions every day. We had joke sessions in Mauthausen, lying amongst corpses. And it was one thing that kept us going. Well, we were in Auschwitz. We had a standard saying, I'm happy that I'm in Auschwitz. If I wouldn't be happy, I'd still be in Auschwitz. Might as well be happy. <laughs> and I tell you the truth. It's something that I remembered and something that I very much based my life on. If something goes sour, you know, that's it, finished. Accept it and get on from there. It doesn't make any difference if you start beating your head against the wall, if you start crying and hollering and so on. You're just wasting time. You just make yourself more miserable than you were before. Instead, leave it, sweep it up and get on with it. And that's how I maintain my sense of humor and pretty well uh, many of the other people who were in the camps. Go ahead. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing your amazing story with us and for being here today. My parents were also Holocaust survivors, and my mother may have actually been in Auschwitz the same time that you were there. And you may have just also answered my question in that, to follow up on all of the things that you said, how do you think you survived when so many did not? Uh, she points out that her parents were uh, Holocaust survivors, and her mother was at Auschwitz at the same time you were. And then she asked, um, why do you think you survived when so many others did not? Uh, I can give you a long story about my good looks, my sunny disposition, <laughs> and my God knows what else. Uh, just luck. We are talking about strictly luck, nothing else. And don't let anybody else tell you anything else, because they were thousands of diseases. Uh, there were uh, so many opportunities. I could have frozen to death in that open railroad car from Auschwitz to, to Mauthausen. I could have died uh, from uh, poisoning when my feet were operated. I, I, I mean, I could have, uh, uh, what's his name? Somebody could have told a good joke to uh, Mengele while I was running by and he wouldn't have looked at me. No, it's strictly 100% luck, nothing else, just luck. Um, while we're finding, while we're getting the microphone to the next person, I want to fill in a couple of the gaps because we won't have to spend time on some of the other questions that in the story. Um, one thing is, uh, and you correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, your sister did survive. You were reunited with her later in the United States. Nivelli, Mr. Levine, the, the magician, this is the part that as magicians, we, it's just poetic injustice. <laughs> Nivelli survived, ended up in New York, less than 30 minutes from where Warner ended up, and they never met. Aww. He found out about uh, Nivelli by reading his obituary in the New York Times. Aww. So uh, also, Warner, as he mentioned a little bit, he gives, uh, what did you, a hundred talks per year? Yes. A hundred talks per year, he goes all over advocating uh, for awareness on the Holocaust, but also at dinner last night, I didn't even realize this, when he, he acts as sort of a, an intervention when things happen, for example, was it just a few days ago, he was called into a school because some teenagers had spray painted swastikas on, they did $25,000 of damage, and um, you know, that's a jailable offense, of course, but part of their treatment, part of retribution is uh, they sit down with Warner, 
and Warner tells his story and, and tries to communicate the problems of their actions. So this is the way he's spreading it and paying it on. So I just wanted to make sure we all understood that um, before we go on. Uh, one, one question. Did you ever lose hope? And if not, what kept your hope? Did you ever lose hope? And if not, what kept your hope alive? Can uh, we go to him next? <clears throat> the little, yeah, little guy right here? He wanted to ask a question. I, I, ne I never, I actually, only on one occasion did I lose hope when they announced that a new uh, commander of Auschwitz had been assigned and his job was to go from camp to camp and liquidate the camp. Uh, that's the only time because if everybody gets killed, you know, there's uh, not a chance of you escaping. But uh, on all other occasions, I was optimistic that nothing is going to happen to me. I was a teenager and uh, I was, uh, I didn't have responsibilities. I, uh, it was just a question of life or death and I knew I'm going to make it. And as you can see, I was right. <laughs> the only problem with this assumption is that millions thought exactly the same and they were wrong. And that's where the tragedy of the Holocaust lies. How did you react to your mother's, I mean, your father's death? How did you react to your father's death? Uh, my father's death uh, was, I, I didn't grasp it fully. The only time I really grasped it and was when uh, a couple of days after his death, we went to the cemetery and they lowered the coffin and I had to shovel earth on the coffin and I still to this day hear the sound of the earth hitting that coffin and I can't get it out of my head. And uh, at that point, I realized this was it. This was the end of my relationship to my father. And uh, that there's no chance, no hope of him coming back. One here. My name is Carol, Carol Lorenz. And I just want to share a little bit of my experience during that time here in the United States of America. My grandparents came here from Poland, names Olszewski and Krasowska. And I remember I was born in 1936, and so I lived my childhood here in the United States of America while the war was going on. I want to tell you, sir, we did not know you are correct. We did not know about the concentration camps. I remember my mother taking coats that we owned here in the United States of America and taking the lining out of those coats and putting in things like aspirin and band-aids and things of that nature, hoping that they would get to our relatives in Poland. But I want you to know that I'm sure they never ever did arrive. I'm a Christian, I'm a Catholic. I understand that the Catholic Church, and I'm sorry because I don't practice any longer because of what has recently happened in the church, but I'd like you to know that I think during the war, the Catholic Church tried very hard 
and I think successfully at times, to rescue Jewish children. And my granddaughter recently, Blair, married a Jewish young man. And so now I have a uh, Jewish granddaughter by the name of Gwen Ellison. Thank you so much, sir, for being here. Just telling her story. How concerned are you about the surge of anti-Semitism, both here and in Europe? How concerned are you about the surge of anti-Semitism in uh, here and in Europe? Uh, I am really not concerned about the surge. The anti-Semitism has been here all the time. It's just now coming to the surface. That's it. Uh, frankly speaking, I know I sound terrible, but I'm glad that I know where it is and that it exists. It gives me an opportunity to force people to educate and teach more. Because if we live in a world of fantasy and we think it doesn't exist, then we are going to have another Holocaust. And we can... Last question. Last question. I'd like to ask about the intervention that you are doing from time to time with schools. What do you feel is the result that you are getting? Are you getting through to these teenagers, or are there some of them that still say, oh, you don't know anything? She's asking, uh, what is the result of when you do interventions? Are you getting through to the students, or do you think that they just hear your words and then they go out the other side? Uh, unfortunately, the students realize fully, after I talk to them, what is going on. I say unfortunately because the schools have never told them that it is illegal to paint swastikas. They gave him absolutely no advice about anti-bias rules and laws and things like that. And that's one thing which I'm trying to get institute in New York State. They have, uh, the students are not aware that these things are illegal. They don't, are not aware that if they get arrested and they get a criminal record, they won't be able to get into colleges, they won't be able to get a college loan, and which is even more, the worst is that they will not be able to get a job. Three out of four people with criminal records are unemployed, and the schools are doing absolutely nothing about it. They are teaching them unnecessary junk, but the important things that may regulate their lives, that will make the difference between true life and death, they don't teach them that. And I'm trying to work on this. And it is extremely, extremely important. I don't want people to be hurt because of stupidity. The Holocaust happened basically because of the stupidity of the people who stood by and didn't do anything. And, uh, okay. Um, we're going to wrap it up there. Warner will, of course, be available if you'd like to see him. I'm going to be doing a tour of the Houdini exhibition outside. You must see it uh, while you're here. It's incredible. But for now, please. Help me thank someone who I hope you view as I do as a living treasure and reminder. Ladies and gentlemen, Warner Wright. <laughs>